I'm going to introduce Dr. Wilson. One second here. So Dr. Wilson is an associate professor at Bethune Cookman University in the Department of Natural Sciences, where she teaches chemistry, biology seminar, inorganic and cancer biology. She has 15 years of laboratory experience working in the fields of biochemistry, nanotechnology, polymer science, and electrophysiology. She has over 15 years of mentoring and training experience with high school, undergraduate, and graduate students in the university setting, as well as in the community. As an associate professor, she is currently using the systematic review method for the following two projects. One, understanding the role of ion channels in the metastasis of glioma cells, and two, chemo prevention of prostate cancer using both natural and synthetic agents. Dr. Wilson has also developed an interest in public health, more specifically cancer health disparities. She is a current Minority Education Program Scholar at the University of Florida, Go Gators, through the One Florida Clinical Research Consortium. The goals of her research project are to characterize the catchment area of the UF Health Center, Health Cancer Center in Gainesville and Jacksonville, which will span a total of 29 counties. In addition, she will also identify and categorize cancer prevention resources, including smoking cessations, outreach organizations and events within the catchment area of the two cancer centers by conducting a systematic review of peer reviewed and gray literature of community interventions in the 29 counties. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Danielle Wilson Howard. Well, good evening, young ladies that I'm familiar with via email. And so um, I just wanna talk with you all today about my experiences um, working in STEM fields. So, I'm, as you can hear from my from the bio, I have a number of different experiences and um, backgrounds. So my PhD is in biochemistry. My undergraduate degree is in chemistry, um, and I chose those fields. You know, graduating from high school because chemistry was of interest to me at that time. Not to say it's not of interest to me now, but one of the key things I want you all to know is that um, do not be afraid of change because there are things in your life that will change. Keep in mind, like your interest in whatever career goal that you have is something that you have not done as of yet. So if you've been exposed to it by either reading about it or looking at it online or looking at it on television or even working with your parents, they may be in a field that you're interested in. But for the most part, it's something that you aspire to do based on what you have seen. And you never know if it's really what you wanna do until you get into it, right? And so that's kind of been the experiences that I've gone through. And so I want to kind of share a couple of, you know, images. I don't have a real presentation. I didn't want to bore you all, but I have a couple of, um, just a couple of slides that I would like to share with you all. And just in telling my story, and I'm pretty sure that your professors will have, you know, similar stories like this. So, okay, let's see. Can you all participate and now see what you're sharing? Over over the area above to access to controls. Oh, okay, very nice. I'm used to using Zoom, but I like this platform as well. Let's throw this over here. Can you all can see my screen? Yes, thumbs up, perfect. So yes. this is kind of my <laughs> this is kind of my story. Um, from Norfolk, Virginia. And 1998, uh, that's a picture of me from high school, you know, and that it was the TLC days where we wore baggy clothes uh, in comparison to, you know, some of the wonderful things that you all are wearing now. Um, and this was me in high school, first generation, um, going to college, was interested in college. My sister hadn't gone to college, did that, my parents. And so what they did is they introduced me into programs. And one of the key things in my life, I mean, similar to this program that you all are in, were the programs that help expose me to different things. So even if I thought, like I said, I wanted to do chemistry, these programs expose me to experiences and resources that stick with me now. And so mm -hmm. the first program that I was in was AVID, Advanced Via Individual Determination. I don't know if any of you all were in that program as well when you were in high school, but it's a career, it's a college preparatory program. And it was amazing. Um, and it introduced me to the Upward Bound program. And Upward Bound was another program where I learned, I did not know this when I was a high school student, that in college you get three meals a day. <laughs> that was one of my inspirations <laughs> for wanting to go to college. It was to get out my parents' house because my mother had stopped cooking. 
And I, you know, learned that in college, they will feed you, even if, you know, it wasn't that good, it was at least food. So <laughs> in addition to the things that I knew I could learn in a classroom and I knew I had the ability to do the work, um, you know, the yeah. Elwood Brown program really boosts my confidence in making sure that I was taking the right classes to make me college ready. We went on college tours. And one college tour in particular was to Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. And after attending this college tour, learning that Lincoln was the first historically black college and university, um, it was in the middle of nowhere. So it was kind of isolated. The class sizes were small. These were all things that I was like, okay, I think I could do well in this, you know, type of environment. In addition, you know, um, I can tell from just the tour that I would get the opportunity to know my teachers and my professors and really work with them to make sure I understood what I was doing. And so I applied to Lincoln. And um, Lincoln had a program at that time called LASER, which was Lincoln Advanced Science, Engineering, and Reinforcement Program. And the LASER program, uh, you had to apply to it during your senior year, and you left high school early because the program started in May. And during that summer, you took 18 credits. And if you got above a 3.0, it paid for tuition, fees, books, stipend, um, room and board, all of those things. So it was 25 students in the program. I was among the 25. And out of the 25 of us, five of us uh, got above a 3.0 and actually, you know, received the scholarship. And I maintained it throughout my tenure at Lincoln. And one of the key things I learned as an undergrad that I'm pretty sure you all are learning in your undergraduates, if you haven't done them all yet, um, just of yet, is to get internships. Internships are so valuable and what I really enjoy and what I like that they have right now that they didn't have as many at that time were the post back programs. So, you know, even for those in their senior years now and currently you can get a post back experience that can help you with that next step. Um, at that point, it was mostly internship programs and there's still like thousands of internships now, even through, throughout the pandemic. They have them and they are looking for students because last summer they were not active. Um, so now they're making it up. They figured out a way to do it virtually. So I, I recommend that any student that's on this call, if you have not looked at REU, which is research experience for undergraduate, go to that site, just Google it. They make it very easy for you to find an internship in your field in any of the STEM fields. Um, and so while I was at Lincoln, I had an internship every single summer. That was one of the things that the laser program required was that we had an internship. And so the first internship I had was at the Food and Drug Administration, and that was working in the government. And what I learned at that point, um, it was in Philadelphia, was I do not like living in big cities. So my DC people, I take my hat off to you. I lived outside of, I lived in Baltimore, Maryland. I am not a city girl. Um, <laughs> I learned that living in Philadelphia it was a lot of roaches, a whole lot of roaches in Philly. Um, <laughs> and I'm not a fan of public transportation, neither. Didn't have a car at that time. And so I used to take a bus to the blue line and then the blue line to the orange line and walk about three blocks to get to my internship in the city. And um, like I said, it was with the FDA. So it was a government related internship. It was different. Um, not one of my most favorite ones. But at that point, we were calibrating columns for HPLC. And um, yeah, they, they didn't do a good job at making us feel like they really cared about what we were doing. Um, because it was, if a column didn't work, they would tell us to put it back in the cabinet, the same cabinet where we got the other ones from. And so I remember leaving that experience earlier than I did any of my other ones because it wasn't as structured, um, like it didn't offer housing. So I ended up staying far away from the, um, the job because I had to find housing on my own in the city. And if you know anything about North Philly, North Philly is not the best part of Philadelphia, but that's where I was staying. Um, and so that next year I decided I needed to see if I can get something at another institution, you know, a university. I had tried the government route. So someone once told me when you're looking at internships and you're looking at different experiences as a grad, as an undergraduate, you want to try to get an internship in industry, government, another research institution, or something international. All right. Remember, you got three summers, <laughs> summer between your freshman to your senior, your sophomore year, from your sophomore to your junior, and your junior to your senior. So try to look at those different opportunities. And so I 
remember it being rather cold in Pennsylvania. And so I was like, well, that, why not Florida? Let me see what internship opportunities are there in Florida. And I looked at the University of Florida and their chemistry department and applied for REU research experience for undergraduate, of course. Um, and I got into the, pro the program and it was an amazing program. Um, the director at that time had a collaboration with about six institutions in France. And so the idea of the REU was you spend the first summer at UF and then the second summer you go to one of the institutions in France and conduct research there. And so I just thought that was amazing. But at the same time, I was very limited in my thinking. Once again, first generation. Um, and I said, I am not going to France. I passed that opportunity up the following summer. I said, no, I don't speak French. They don't wear deodorant in France. I mean, I was just not the brightest at all. <laughs> just very close minded at that time, but I was young, you know? And, and so he asked me a number of times, like, Danielle, you, I really think this would be a good opportunity for you. So if I can say I regret anything in my life, it was not taking that chance and the opportunity to go to France. Um, and I, and I always tell students that, like, if you have an opportunity to go international, please take it up. It's three months. It's not your entire life. They're not saying move there for good, but please don't be closed minded like I was. So that was a lesson that I learned. But while I was at UF, um, I fell in love with the institution. I, I really did. It was sunny. <laughs> it was hot. Um, when my experiments didn't work at that point, I was looking at uh, developing gold nanoparticles. And if we had any issues, you can always just go outside and take a walk. You couldn't do that in, you know, Pennsylvania when it was cold because you would freeze and just come back even more frustrated. But in Florida, you could, you know, just go and take a walk. If you got frustrated with your research, come back to it. And it was a very diverse um, campus. And so my research group had people from all over the world. And I, I really like that aspect of it. Um, and they really seemed to care about you in the chemistry department. So I had a very successful um, internship there, which led me to apply there for graduate school. My last internship um, opportunity that I took was, or that the first offer I had was France. I turned that down. Second offer I had, remember I said you want to look for one in industry. Well, I did get one. It was with DuPont um, and Texas, and it was in La Porta, Texas. And La Porta, Texas is like in the middle of nowhere once again, but I had learned my lesson from my previous internship because I still didn't have a car and I knew that this one did not offer housing as well. And so they said, well, one of the employees will put you up in their house. And I was like, well, I don't have a car. I was like, is there public transportation? They're like, no, not so much, not in La Porta, Texas. And it was like, well, there's another intern who also needs housing. So you and her will room together and you can ride with her to work and then y'all will share the same office. And I was like, that is just too much dependency on one person. So I was like, nah, maybe not this opportunity. It just did not seem like a good fit. And I remember going to a seminar and learning about um, this one faculty member at the Department of Health who was doing research on neurotransmitters um, in upstate New York. And I had a lot of questions. I was very much engaged with his research. And so when I told my advisor that I was not going to take the DuPont experience he reached out to him and he said oh, he remembered me and said yeah have her apply to our program and I got in there and it was an excellent opportunity that program was joint with Cornell so I actually end up you know once again back in that um, academic and government um, uh, kind of experience where we would go to Cornell one week and spend time there and do research and I learned about oh my gosh so many different things this first time I worked in a, like a clean lab um, and nanolithography and all of those different things um, but it was an excellent opportunity and I did that all through college and senior year coming. I still don't know what I want to do. I'm like all these experiences. And so if you are a senior and you're like, I think I want to do this. I don't know if I want to do that. Know that that is normal. You will get through it. You know, think about it. You've been in school forever <laughs> and you are coming to a point where things are going to change. You know, you may want to go to grad school. You may not. Um, and it's OK. Just be in that space, but make steps towards your next your next skill set, you know, that you're going to develop, whether that's going to be an industry or if you're going to go on to graduate school or medical school or, you know, get your MBA, um, any of those things. Know that senior year is very stressful. And so my senior year, I was in the MARC program, which is Minority Access for Research Careers. 
And part of the MARC program stated that, you know, you have to apply for a PhD program. And so I was like, okay, so I'll go through the pro process for applying for a PhD program, program which included taking a GRE and um, applying to schools. And I knew I liked University of Florida, so that was one of my top choices. And um, so I went through the process and a GRE did horrible on it. I prepared as you know for months for it and just did not do a great job on it. And to stick kind of like a needle in the haystack, once you finish taking a GRE at that point, they gave out this little booklet and on the back it had a little paragraph that said to disable minority and international students that basically said like, we don't expect you to do as great on this and you know, don't feel bad. It was just awful. Um, but one of the key things that I did do was I had three internships. So even though I didn't do well on the exam for, you know, for graduate school entrance, I remember the director coordinator at University of Florida, but the chemistry program said, you know, most of the people that score really high on the GRE actually do worse in the program because they didn't have the social skills to adapt. And so I was like, oh, okay, let me, you know, definitely I didn't give up and not apply because of my test scores. I was like, okay, what else do I have in my application that is very strong? Well, I had three research experience internships under my belt. I had a good, a decent GPA at 3.4, wasn't even that high, I had a 3.4. I was at 3.8 or nine at that point. Um, but it was the research experience. I didn't have any published papers at that time. They weren't pushing them as hard. But I, I had, the, I showed that I could work within a lab. You know, I can integrate into a lab setting and I can get the job done. And so with that, I got into University of Florida. I also had a recommendation from a faculty member who was from the University of Florida because I, he was the director of the program. So even though I decided not to go to France, he still wanted me to come to the university. Um, and, and I did, and I applied to the, PhD program in analytical chemistry. Got to the University of Florida, even got a, another scholarship for another project program called AGEP, it's Alliance Graduate Education for the Professoriate. And this one included a laptop, so I thought that was pretty cool. This is also funded through NSF. This is a NSF, National Science Foundation program. This is a National Science Foundation program, and this one is a National Institute of Health program. So if not for these programs, I would not be where I'm sitting today. And so that's why I love to give back to them. Um, oh, and I also received the LSAM, which is the Lewis Stoltz Alliance for Minority Participation, another NSF program, while I was an undergraduate and then also when I was a graduate student. Um, applied to UF, got in there on um, the, um, got into their analytical chemistry program for the PhD, realized two years in, I did not like analytical chemistry. <laughs> I chose it because every faculty member that I did a research project with as an undergraduate, all the interns, they were all analytical chemists. I thought analytical chemistry was just nanotechnology. It was not. It was a whole field that focused on mass spectrometry, that focused on separation, all of these other techniques. And I knew that I needed some type of biological or human connection. Analytical chemistry, there's your interest is in making things sensitive and selective, and it's more instrumentation, you know, that you're interested in the outcome, um, some type of outcome that's related to this instrumentation and being able to manipulate it and control it. It's interesting, but it wasn't anything that was super interesting enough to keep me engaged. Like I remember being in my mass spec class thinking like, we were talking about pumps for three weeks. I did not know you go that much in detail what about pumps. I'm like, are we still talking about pumps? Like then you cut on and off. That's all I need to know about pumps. But no, that we were learning about, oh, just about everything. And I talked with the coordinator and he said, well, you know, um, he asked me to think about like other things that I was interested in. And at that point, all of the grades where I had A's and B's were in the biochemistry areas. And so I was like, well, I do better in these areas. He was like, well, you, are you interested? I was like, I think I do need some type of biological application. And at that point, I switched over from analytical chemistry. I got my master's in analytical chemistry and then went on to biochemistry to do my PhD. And I even changed research advisors. And so here is a picture of me <laughs> conducting my new research, um, which was the electrochemistry. And we were looking at ion channels. And at this point, I had the opportunity to work with another faculty member at UT Southwestern. And so I was able to spend another summer and Texas, so keep in mind, you stick with education, you'll be able to travel and they will pay for it and house you. 
And so um, did a diversity supplement, which is funded by the National Science Foundation, excuse me, National Institute of Health. Went and worked with him and he was just like the best mentor ever. He was like one of the founding fathers of the mechanosensitive channel of large conductance, which was the ion channel that we were using at that time and trying to integrate it into a, a synthetic bilayer, put it on a device so that the military could eventually use it as a biochip. Um, that was my senior project. And that is a picture with me and my uh, tip dip set, set up. And so I finished that research and was able to graduate in 2009 with my PhD. And that's picture me and all my family and friends that came down to support. And what I want to say about the overall experience is while I went through that, even though I stumbled and I realized there were things that I did like and things that I did not like, I had mentors along the way that helped me hone in on my skill set, right? And so here is a picture of Dr. Blunt. He's the one from the University of Texas. I mean, just perfect for my scientific skills um, and helping me to understand electrophysiology and, and cells and how you actually look into the mem cellular membrane of bacteria. I mean, very, very specific for working in a lab. You know, and this is Dr. Randy Duran. He was my research advisor who group I switched to. In addition, he was also the director of the REU program. And so, um, after working with me, he built a relationship with my mentor at Lincoln and brought more students down from Lincoln University, wrote grants to keep them coming. And then he moved to LSU the year after I graduated. Um, but those are like some of my scientific advisors who helped me develop skill sets within the lab. Dr. Tan, he was the faculty member that I did my um, internship with at UF who introduced me to nanotechnology, which is why I thought all of analytical chemistry was nanotechnology, and I soon learned that it was different. Dr. Duran was a polymer scientist. And, um, and, and so these are some of my scientific mentors. Other individuals that you'll see on this slide that served as mentors, Ms. Perry, she was the secretary of the Office of Graduate Minority Programs. She helped me learn how to stand strong as an individual and know you know, what I want and to stand up for it, even if, you know, even if I felt like I was alone, to know that God was always with me and if I didn't feel like something was right to voice it and let, let others know. So I say that because if, for those that are going to graduate school, you may come across situations and for those who may be going to other, you know, professional schools as well, where you feel strongly about something that you're doing and your colleagues may not, or your director or your advisors, they may not agree with you. Um, but you still have to be able to voice your opinion professionally and effectively so that you all can get to a collective um, agreement as to whatever you're going through, whatever that situation is. And Ms. Perry taught me that, you know. Um, Ms. Shelley, she was my laser coordinator. She's like an auntie to me to this day. And just from her stories, I learned that some of the experiences that I was doing and going through was normal because sometimes you can feel like you're alone and no one else has gone through this. And I know, especially during COVID, the amount of isolation is ridiculous. Just know that you are not alone going through it. And, and sometimes it's not just a situation that's happened to you, happening to you, it's part of the process to make you stronger. And that was something that Ms. Shelley taught me. So she. She really showed me how to stay fast, right? And how to remain steadfast. This is Matt Bowman. Um, I call him a military consultant slash hustler because he retired from the Navy at age 40. I met him in like 2012 and he was already retired. And uh, okay, let's see. He's a consultant for BEA, which is the Black Engineer of the Year Award Conference that's put on annually in DC. Um, he's, he organized that. He has two vineyards, his father in South Carolina and one in McAnobie where he's, um, he has his own wine. It's called farmhouse wine or McAnobie wine. It's a muscadine wine. Uh, he also opened recently a farmhouse where people can go and stay and visit and, you know, uh, what else does he do? He just does so many different things. And, and it's truly like um, an innovator, an entrepreneur, still has his connections with the military. And he just, I learned from him that you have to go after the opportunity. Even if you think that you may not be ready, go after it. Let them tell you no. Don't tell yourself no, you're not good enough for the opportunity. Let them tell you no. So go after it and, um, you know, see if God opens that door for you. 
uh, Dr. Alexander. He's the associate dean at the University of Florida. And um, he was awesome because I learned from him how to navigate. He had his JD, but he worked in the College of Journalism. And so I'm like, how do you have one degree, but you work in this other field? And he told me the story about how he was always interested in journalism and begin to kind of read different articles and really get into the field. And he was in the law school initially, interviewed with the College of Journalism, and they accepted him. And and he made the switch and he stayed with the College of Journalism for 15 years before going to eventually get his PhD. And now he's the chancellor at, I believe it's the University of Arkansas, um, Dr. Ann Donnelly. Dr. Ann Donnelly let me know that, you know, no matter how long it takes for you to complete your PhD, just complete it. If you sign up to do that process and go through it, then go through it. She said it took her 10 years to complete hers. But once she did complete it, she was able to um, bring so many other students along. So the AGEP program that I was part of, she was the director of it. Under her, 98 minority scientists and engineers obtain their PhD between three different institutions because of the funding and the mentorship that she provided. So still reach out to her. She's currently the director of undergraduate research at the University of Florida. Dr. Henry Frierson saw that I had, you know, the skill set of teaching before I did because I would not have gone into education and became a faculty member. I just knew I was going to go far away into industry and do something. But Dr. Frierson was like, no, you you can teach. And this um, Dr. Kathy Me introduced the whole field of public health to me and helped me understand even more why I felt like my research had to have some type of biological application. And that's to connect my research to a human application, right? And so I learned about the field of public health. And so now what I do is more translational science where I'm helping, I'm working now with the center for, um, I finished the projects that um, Dr. Jones talked about. Those were my initial projects to begin to work with the University of Florida again as a faculty member. And now I'm working with the STEM Center for um, translational communication where we're translating the science behind different diseases to the public and so we do that through different ways and so one of them is the meet alex platform and alex is a virtual human technology and we're helping patients get screened for colorectal cancer using virtual doctors or virtual clinicians and so the whole process to develop these virtual clinicians i've been on um been involved with and i've added one additional um, component to it which is the community health worker model where we're using community health workers to recruit and employ alex to do this recruitment the caw is there to answer any questions so that people still have that human to human connection but all the education is being done through alex and the cool thing about alex is we have three four actually six different versions and we've had focus groups and people to take in, um, to be involved in the whole evolution of Alex. And so these were the initial images of Alex and at the focus groups, we ended up with these different versions of it in which people found were credible um, and, and just more acceptable. And that's very important when you're looking at virtual technology, um, especially when you're implementing it and you want this virtual human to influence someone's decision to get screened or not get screened. And that's the current process and project that I'm on, in addition to this really large project where I've been able to kind of use my entire skill set, things that I've learned in public health and being able to translate science, which is called, you know, this new initiative is called Pandemic Win. I have students and researchers on it, where as a research arm to the project that we're applying the grants to fund because research costs a lot of money. But then there's a service part of it. Like Cookman, one of our theories is enter to learn the part to serve. And so our surface way is going to be actually the main way that we disseminate the information that we learn um, and that we also partner and serve our community. So we're partnering with the Department of Health to offer services to non-healthcare essential employees. So your grocery store workers, your um, retail store workers, your restaurant workers, all of those people who have been on the front line since the pandemic began. And they don't always have access to the best healthcare information. Most of their sources are, you know, from different media sources. And so what we want to do is provide them with um, non-biased sources 
so that they can make informed decisions. Those that aren't, you know, necessarily biased by any political group, but just the science behind it. And that's what our, we want to provide sources and we want to translate the science so that they can make informed decisions, provide testing services as well as vaccination for them by working with the um, Department of Health, and then also promote their businesses to consumers using our pandemic win trackers who will rank local businesses um, and the way that they social distance. We upload the pictures to our website as well as Google reviews so people can see ahead of time, like if they go to a restaurant, does this restaurant offer outdoor seating? Are the waiters or waitress wearing masks? Are the cooks wearing masks and gloves? All of those different things. And then get to a point where we're celebrating these different videos, I mean, businesses and giving testimonials and stuff from, you know, survivors and tips as to how to survive the pandemic or survive COVID if you get it. So our kind of theory with pandemic win is if you try something new during the pandemic, then you're winning. Um, because we all had to try something new and it's not been easy for anyone, especially these businesses to stay afloat during a pandemic. And we've had the luxury, some of us have had the luxury of working from home when others have not. So let's celebrate those who have not. So that's kind of like everything in a nutshell from like where I started with chemistry, realized that I didn't necessarily want to work in a lab, but I still wanted to use my science to help people and been able to do that by the different, um, platforms and stuff and working with different mentors. So know that you can always have a mentor. Your mentor may not necessarily be in your field. Your mentor may not be a PhD. You know, your mentor may not look like you, but that doesn't mean that you can't gain anything from this individual. And then do the same thing, give back to those once you're done. So that's a little bit about me, skill set, <laughs> all of those different things, how to be able to maneuver and move with your different skill set. So if you all have any questions, I'm open for questions now. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Um, so I have a question as um, a senior who's about to uh, complete my undergrad. Um, I didn't have as much, <laughs> thank you. I didn't have as much experience in, so I am actually interested in research. But I didn't okay. have as much experience as um, uh, you were able to, because again, I learned a little bit later that I was supposed to be getting those things done way before then. But, you know, it's already a little bit too late for that. So I guess for someone in my case, how can I still be able to, um, any advice on how I can still put myself out there, even though my resume might not be as, you know, split it or that, Yes. filled with so many experience throughout my undergrad years. Okay, so what is your career goals? So or what are your career goals? Right now, I think what I'm certain of is that I do want to do something with research, uh, a bio research to be exact. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that has to do with the new technology that is out right now, like CRISPR, gene uh, editing, anything around those um, in those fields is what I am interested in uh, to go into. Okay, and you are a senior, a graduating in May? Yes. Okay, well, congratulations on making it that far. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, so what you can do, <laughs> you can always look for post back programs or go ahead and apply directly to graduate school. What they're going to be looking for in graduate school is an application package. I don't know if the deadlines have passed. Now, if the deadlines have passed at the graduate schools that you're interested in, I'm going to recommend that you reach out to those graduate schools because of the pandemic, everyone is a little bit more flexible than what they used to be. I can tell you that much, um, especially with those applications. And if you're expressing interest and in, they need numbers. <laughs> um, you want to look at your overall package. So you may not be strong in the research. How are your test taking skills? So, so okay, how about that GPA? Is the GPA above a 3.2, if you don't mind sharing? Exactly, 3.0. Okay, no problem. Okay, so at least you got that 3.0. Okay, with the test taken, graduate in May, but you know you want to do research. So that's that's important and that's that's key. 
Um, I'm going to recommend once again that you still do apply to those programs. Look and see what the GPA requirement is. Look at those deadlines. See if you missed them. If you did, you want to look at post back programs because your interest is research. And so a number of institutions, they do have post back programs. I'm also going to recommend that you look for the ones that will pay you, not for the ones that you have to pay for. Okay, because if you've had to pay for undergraduate already, that's enough. <laughs> when you go to get your PhD, they usually have, um, especially if you're interested in any field in STEM, they will pay you to get your PhD. You know, um, they pay you, you teach classes, and they pay you <laughs> to do that. Um, and then they have additional fellowships because you're a minority woman that you can add on top of that, you know. But just because you're interested in STEM, they need teaching assistance. And so they usually pay their graduate students that are getting their PhDs to teach the classes. And then that way you get your research experience at the same time. I'm gonna also recommend the University of Florida, just plug that in <laughs> because University of Florida has this program called BOE. Write that down, BOE is the Board of Education Program. And what the Board of Education Program does, and it's for not even just for students that are interested in science, but any minority PhD student that is admitted to UF could go and, um, oh, yeah, post that program. Thank you. They are admitted to the, they apply for the BOE program. BOE brings you down during the summer before the fall semester starts. And you take a research methods course, you take a research statistics course, and you're able to spend time in a department that you're interested in conducting research. So if you're interested in like the biology, the microbiology, they have a cancer biology program at UF, you will spend time with those different departments conducting research. So when the fall starts and you begin your rotations, you're already ahead of the game. So I know UF has that program and they've institutionalized it. It's not grant funded, it's through the university, which is a wonderful thing. They also give you money for housing during the summer. They give you $1,500 just for the summer. And then they also put money on your, your um, school card so that you can eat in the cafe and you get a peer mentor. So, and you come in as a cohort. So I really recommend that program. And um, Dr. Frierson is still currently the Dean at UF. And so you can also tell him that you spoke with me and that I recommended <laughs> that you talk with him about it. And then you look at any other post bat programs that you're interested in and begin to apply for them, contact the coordinators, talk with them, do not be scared, okay? If you're scared, just right, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared about 10 times and then you will no longer be scared. You'll be past it and over it. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, you referenced um, opting out of that trip to Paris as being kind of your one big regret. What do you feel like was the pivotal experience that kind of really changed the trajectory of your career and past? So what was the Paris was the one time that you wish you had taken it up. What was the opportunity that you did take advantage of that was really pivotal in your future? Um, oh, that's a really great question. So I would say. <laughs> I would say that the choice to do, once I got my PhD, I made that the choice, like I decided that I did not wanna go back into the labs. And that was terrifying because I just got a PhD in biochemistry. And what the next step for a PhD in biochemistry is a postdoc in biochemistry where you continue to you know, build your laboratory skills so that you can be a laboratory faculty member instructor and all of those things. And so being honest with myself and saying that I did not want to go that route and that God has something for me out there, you know, that he would not have given me these experiences and then also put put it in my heart so much that um, 
that and just leave me hanging. And so I voiced how I feel felt a lot to my mentors. And so I remember um Dr. Donnelly, the director of AGEP, telling her how I felt. And she said, well, come work with me when you finish. She's like, I need some help in the office. And so we'll create a postdoc position for you. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, we'll create a postdoc position for you until you find a postdoc position that you're looking for. So that's what I mean when I say, like, always pray and be honest with yourself because God has a plan for you. You may not see it playing out. You may not know it. But your mentors, they see something in you. And they will believe in you and they will develop things for you if they have the means to do it. And so she did that. And, um, you know, I end up doing focus, not even focus group, I end up doing interview, interview, I end up doing interview research with her and I learned qualitative and quantitative methods and mixed methods for doing research and more social science under, under her belt. And then I, um, we had Dr. Bern Mr. Bernard Batson come over from the University of South Florida. And I spoke with him and I was telling him what I was doing. And he was like, okay, so you don't want to, and I was like, no, I don't want to work in a lab. Sorry. It was hard to be that honest, you know, because I just got the degree in it. And he was like, okay, I think I might know something. I might have something for you. And I'm like, okay. And he said, um, he introduced me to Kathy Mead and they were actually looking for a coordinator for a um, undergraduate program that they just received a grant for. And they were like, well, I think we could turn into a postdoc. And so they was like, you know, come give a talk. Tell us about your research and your experience mentoring, <laughs> ironically enough. And then so I told them about, you know, the BOE program. I just informed you about I helped write the procedure manual for that book. And I mentor for it every single summer um, and helping new first year graduate students get acclimated to UF. And so they love that experience and that idea and the simple fact that I had the science background and they were like, okay, we want to turn this coordinator position into kind of a coordinator postdoc position where you can help the students train in proteomics, which is, you know, protein science. And it was proteomics related to cancer, so cancer proteomics. But once we're finished training the students, which would be the first six months, you can decide if you want to continue in the science route and proteomics or if you want to come over here to public health and do health education with me. And I was like, okay, that was a no brainer. I knew I wanted to go in that route in that direction. And so once I started doing research with Dr. Mead, and then I began to increase my publications in public health and that just changed my trajectory where now my experiences are based on public health and not necessarily just in the science, but it took a while for me to still kind of like mentally make that change. And now I'm starting to see more science educators and you know individuals who don't want to necessarily practice science but will want to promote science and increase you know participation so i think like that that pivotal route was once i graduated and realized like this is what i want to do with my life i don't know how it's going to look but i'm going to keep going in this direction and seeing what doors got open for me so i hope that helped <laughs> As you advanced yourself in uh, in the science, especially in grad school and then your PhD, did you ever feel pressure to to lean towards the medicine side of STEM? Um, I know usually, typically, when people who are STEM undergrads, they're usually often kind of coaxed into the "Don't you want to be a doctor?" <laughs> I say that as a former STEM person, but um, so how did you address that? Because you seem to be very self aware in terms of um, being clear on what you're interested in and being unafraid to say to pass up on opportunities and and not feel like you have to take something just because someone offers it how did you develop that and then also did you feel the pressure about medical school um i did feel the pressure about medical school like originally when i was an undergrad if you would have asked me i would i wanted to be a dermatologist i was like i want to be a dermatologist that was my line and so i think sometimes an undergraduate you have a line that you stick to because that's your line and that's what got you to undergraduate, which is great, you know, high school, you gotta figure out that next step is college, but college, why? You know, and mine was, I wanna be a dermatologist. And so in order to be a dermatologist, I have to go to college, right? And so <laughs> I, um, I then realized, you know, I, I got a scholarship for um, undergraduate and I realized there was no scholarships for medical school. Like, you, you mean I have to pay for this? I'm like, I didn't pay for high school. I didn't pay for middle school. I, I didn't pay for college. Why do I have to pay for school now? Like, that's not fair. <laughs> and that's kind of how I always thought of things. I was just like, you know, at what point, how do you just decide how? Now you pay for school. Um, 
especially if there's scholarship opportunity for it. But with medical school, there not being any scholarship opportunities and learning about the cost of medical school, as well as um, the MCAT and how dire that exam was and knowing myself that I did not test well. That was a lot of pressure for something that I've never done before. You know, I realized that I had a lot of research experience, but I didn't have too much shadowing experience. And it was too late for me to try to get shadowing experiences and then have to come out of pocket. So that slowly changed, you know, my trajectory towards research. But even though you make I might seem self-aware, I was not. I just knew what I did not want to do. <laughs> and that's kind of what drove what I did do, you know, because I was like, okay, I don't want to do this. this this is not for me and so I never knew what the world of you know I knew research and at one point I thought research was only in the lab it wasn't until I began to do the public health that I was like oh so you all do research with people and it's not just clinical like that was a aha moment on the job where I wish I would have known about it as an undergraduate I would have got my MPH uh, master's in public health but I did not because um, I had already did a PhD and I was tired. <laughs> I was like, I am not going back to school. I will build up my experience as a PhD. Um, <laughs> yeah, I will build up my experience as a PhD before going about to get another degree. And um, believe it or not, uh, throughout this entire process, I finally feel like this is where I'm supposed to be a faculty member doing research and translational science now keep in mind translational science is a new field it started in 2003 and so they are still refining it and so the whole time that they're refining this field i'm growing up parallel with it to the point where now translational science communication is so novel and new i'm part of that novel and new team like there's no other translation communication center in the united states uf has the only one and the director of it is my mentor. She's like my big sister. Um, and I'm learning so much and working with her. I'm learning so much theory stuff and dissemination and implementation where I should be getting a degree in it, but you know, we'll just do the publications. They're equally <laughs> beneficial. So, so just, you know, just know that uh, I always say once again, just be true to yourself and and let your skills and your experiences, those soft skills, those people skills, as well as your scientific skills. Because right now, the things that I learned in a lab help me to understand and interpret it to others, you know, and that's powerful. Um, even though I'm not practicing them, I can understand science stuff and just think about COVID, how many things have been misconstrued and just blown out the water because you have people who do not have a science background trying to understand something as scientific. So you can hear something and be like, okay, that's bogus and doesn't make any sense. Now, how do you know? It's like, you know, my PhD is in biochemistry, right? Like, let me explain to you why this doesn't make sense. You have a, a lot of people that, you know, it was this one meme that, you know, they said, you don't trust the PhD with the science degree. You trust Homer Simpson who can barely pass high school chemistry, you know? And that's where we've been with this pandemic. And, um, but I think we're, we're turning the curve in it and we're going in the right direction. So, yeah, are there any other questions, comments, feedback? I've enjoyed this discussion so, so far. So. Mm -hmm. so you came from um, you came from Virginia, and now you're in Florida. Do you uh, did you transfer? Is are you like a self transfer, or did you bring family with you? Did you have family in Florida that kept you in the area? Because I'm always nervous about leaving Florida. One because I've lived other places, and the climate is so conducive to what makes me happy that I really just don't want to. But right now, there's besides school right now, there's nothing really anchoring me to Florida even, anymore. Even though I have a lot of, I have a lot of family here, but um, not not that they're not close, but nothing that would stop me from taking an uh, opportunity somewhere else. So how did you migrate from Virginia to Florida? Okay, well, uh, to be honest, I am a middle child, so middle children tend to leave. So um, it was. I left Virginia, went to Pennsylvania, and while I was in Pennsylvania, you know, went to, that's when I had the opportunity to come to Florida for graduate school. And Florida just has always seemed like home. And so I know what you mean about this weather thing. <laughs> it was one of the reasons why I chose to come down here. Um, 
And so when I moved down here to become a faculty member at Bethune-Cookman, I did bring my mother with me. Prior to that, it had just been me um, kind of traveling by myself. Most of the time, you know, um, when I was in school, it was easy because, you know, if you're going to another school, you'll stay in a dorm or they have graduate housing like University of Florida. They have graduate housing and you can, um, you know, stay there. It's an apartment. It's not like you're with the undergraduate. Some of the, the graduate housing was off campus. Um, and I was like, okay, that's easy. So that was a, set, a nice setup for me. In addition, I always moved in programs. So I was, I never felt alone because I was always entering a program. So it would always be a cohort of us. Like, you know, one of my, uh, and I have so many best friends from each program that I've been to. I'm like, that's my Tampa friends. That's my UF friends. That's my Baltimore friends. Those are my undergraduate friends, just all these clusters of friends. Um, and so that made it easy as well. You know, I, I remember when I moved before working at Bethune Cookman, I was working as a faculty member at Bowie State in Maryland. And I chose that I'm like, okay, this isn't too far from home in um, Virginia. And I used to drive home like almost every other weekend. And then I realized everybody had their own thing going on. So I'm just sitting there looking crazy. <laughs> it was no longer home. Um, and I was like, okay, well, let me really find what's home for me. And so when I came to Cookman to become a, um, <laughs> it was a drive. <laughs> like a four hour drive every weekend just for y'all to everybody I, like they were too busy to hang out with me so I was just like yeah when I got the opportunity to come to Cookman um I moved down here I brought my mother with me my parents were divorced they've been divorced for a long time um my mother she wasn't like as happy as my father was he had moved on she really didn't and so she came down with me and it also gave her a break you know, I'm like, you've worked long enough. Let's, you know, just kind of figure out what you really want to do. And she just did not understand that. But it was good. It was definitely a blessing. And so it's fun now. After moving to, to Florida, after a month, I met the guy who's now my husband. <laughs> we dated for like three years. I have a son. I bought a house. Things were, like I say, God aligned it up. He'll line it up for you. You just got to follow him and don't be, you know, don't be scared, but um, <laughs> he'll line it up for you. You just got to, you know, there may be something for you somewhere else. If the opportunities arise, then you just, you know, ask the people in whatever, like if you're, if it's a job or if it's a, a, a um, graduate program, ask them about house and ask them what do they recommend, which, what should you do? And they more than likely will help you and then they will connect you with individuals and then those people will be lifelong friends. So a really good question. Mm -hmm. And thank get out you. of order. You can do it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you may come back. You'll appreciate Florida more. Or you may stay wherever you are. <laughs> Try California, the weather's the same, or Texas, except for when it snows. <laughs> You'll be okay. <laughs> But well, I know Florida people don't like to live, leave Florida, but you can. <laughs> yeah, I'm a native Floridian. I'm not going anywhere. This weather I is just too good. <laughs> I'm like not to live. anywhere. I've tried. No. See, you I tried it though. Uh, yeah, I, I can't. I, I just cannot. <laughs> I'm sorry. Where did you go and how long? I went to Georgia for one year and I couldn't open my car door because it snowed there. And I, I just, that was enough. <laughs> that was enough. Like it's hard to beat the weather here in Florida mm -hmm. and that's what keeps most of us here. But I would say to, you know, everyone on the call is explore while you're young, before you get your feet in cement, STEM will take you places that no other fields will. And take those opportunities, um, like she's saying, to um, just get to know yourself. Because with Dr. Wilson, she discovered, I know what I want and I'm going to stick to what I want. I'm not going to let someone tell me to do something that I don't want to do. I know what my passion is. And you have to find your passion. And it may not be here in Florida, it may be somewhere else. So just take a chance, take a chance on yourself. I always tell people, choose yourself um, because other people are gonna choose themselves. So choose yourself, you're young, explore. Because mm -hmm. in these fields, that's what we get a chance to do. Um, 
STEM fields will take you, they, they, they will take you far. They will. France. Yeah. <laughs> Don't turn it down like I did. <laughs> like yes, go to France. <laughs> go to France if you're given the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Do we but have any more questions there, for Dr. Yeah. Wilson? Is there anyone else that has any other questions for Dr. Wilson? Uh, I don't have a question, but I, I do want to say that I really appreciated the advice you gave on exploring the different industries. So, yes. in terms of corporate, government, research, and international, uh, in terms of internships for each summer, because it allows you to get a feel of what's right for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that will definitely be helpful towards your future. Definitely. Yep. And once you get one internship, I'm telling you, it opens the door for the rest of them. So just you only need one experience. That's what they look for. Has this person done anything before? When they're looking at your resume, you just need one door open. Then the rest mm -hmm. will continue, begin to open. So and you will be good. <laughs> Are there any other faces now? <laughs> <laughs> look, you all look like me. <laughs> No, right? <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions for Dr. Wilson, Howard, before she goes? Well, Dr. Wilson, we want to say thank you so much for an amazing presentation. Um, the information you shared with our participants will, you know, stick with them. For a very long time, I'm sure it was very helpful. Um, the different industries and the different things you asked them to take a look at, the post bag and all that stuff, very valuable information. And um, I'm going to say they are pretty lucky to be in this position. I did not have a mentor when I was looking at your screens, all the people that came that you I did not get that opportunity and that they have this opportunity to have mentors it is a very precious thing and it will take you far so um we appreciate everything that you've said tonight and just for encouraging our participants and uh thank you so much <laughs>